revolutionary, unthinkable, impossible. Lyra appeared out of nowhere, a gentle-mannered savant who began to weave a vision of a healed earth. She was not the first, nor was she the last. When the world stood aflame, dreamers looked for possibilities, believers sought miracles, and they all fought to keep hope alive in people. But Lyra had more than the orators. She presented a tangible technology, both possible and miraculous. Experts mobilized to find a catch, a flaw, however tiny, which would render it useless. They found nothing. With its foundations in the Ultralux alternate reality software, Lyra's program appeared capable of running on simple, mass-producible gear. It could keep a person suspended for several years in hibernation-like stasis with slowed metabolism, massively reducing the amount of resources needed to sustain them, especially since the only needs remaining were those necessary for survival. Yet pressing pause on the lives of about 95% of citizens, even for a month, was a controversial notion. Several years? Insanity. Stasis or not, people would still age. Their diseases would progress. Not everyone would wake back up. The years of preparations weren't merely about the technical side of the endeavor. It was also one of the greatest challenges of mass psychology humanity had had to face. Limiting the simulation to five years was a massive factor in the overall success. Yes, it wasn't enough time to heal the Earth but it was enough to begin reversing the damage and to set up the foundations for new standards which could then be followed by the whole of society for decades or centuries to come. The project became humanity's biggest chance for long-term survival without decimating quality of life. Lyra had not helped people keep their hope alive. She had given them a brand new one. But now, she was no more. And the world was ablaze in yet another way. Sabrina scrolled through the countless, countless discussions about Lyra's death. Sadness, anger, anxiety. So much anxiety. It took mere minutes for conspiracy theories to spill out into every corner of the internet, fanning the flames of the many little rebellions, each with their own agenda, competing for the eager minds. Others tried to disperse the mistrust, explain the fears away. The never-ending game of tug-of-war. It wasn't a heart attack. She was too young for that. Yes, but she was under a lot of stress. She was murdered, I'm sure. I don't know why just yet, but she was. Her death won't change anything. There was no reason to kill her. I don't believe she hadn't had a sac implant on her heart. All the important people have them. There are many reasons people decide not to get them. It's a sign. We must stop hope. Sometimes things just happen, for no reason other than the universe being kind or cruel. Downstairs, the doorbell announced Sabrina's father's friend. Sabrina got up to close the door to her room, but before she could do it, she heard the man say, David, it was not a heart attack. Sabrina froze with her hand on the handle. It was as if she heard another post in the digital sea. But this time the author was not a random doing guesswork. It was Benjamin, a doctor, one of the team leaders responsible for adjusting the hibernation chambers designed for people with serious health issues. He was in the know. What are you talking about? Father asked. A quiet thud announced at the exit door closing. Lyra committed suicide. Sabrina stepped out of her room as quietly as she could. She snuck through the hallway and reached the staircase railing. Her father and Benjamin walked up to the living room table and Benjamin pressed his ring to the display's reader. A still image of an older woman's face appeared on the screen. What is this? Ben started the video. Sabrina knelt down and pressed her face against the railing, trying to see better. My name is Madeline Segal, and Lyra Segal is, was, my daughter. 
The woman's voice was quiet, and she visibly struggled to keep it steady. She meant to let her words ring clear, yet she stumbled over them as she spoke. My daughter did not overdose. She took her life. I found her on the floor of her room, together with a syringe and a note asking me to lie, which I'd done to honor her wish. But I can't. I can't do it. I don't understand why. Madeline's voice cracked fully, and she winced when she tried to keep on talking. She reached for something outside the view of the camera and pulled it closer to herself, as if she could find solace in the item. She was at peace just yesterday. Something isn't right. I do not trust that note. My daughter always told me everything. And yet I'm left here, in this darkness. Benjamin paused the video. That's the gist of it. Father pressed a finger to his lips, and like in a tick, he jerked his head to push the unruly hair back. Where did you get this? He asked, quietly. They didn't keep it a secret only made sure it doesn't reach the public. Was it meant for the public? I don't know. Can you imagine? I'd rather not. The weight of the silence that fell between them could be felt throughout the house. Then father said, Lyra wasn't meant for this sort of bird and we knew that. We did not protect her enough. I keep going over it in my head. She seemed fine just yesterday. Excited, energetic, happy. Should we have known? Someone should have known. There are always signs. Father pressed a hand to his forehead. God, I wish she'd left us a time machine on top of hope. I'd give so much to just wake up when it's all over. Envious of those that go in? No. Envious of those who lived in the past century and hopefully of those who will live in the next. Benjamin didn't stay long after that. They talked for a little while in hushed voices, as if finally remembering Sabrina was still in the same house, and then he left. She walked down the stairs on shaky legs. Father stood by the table, arms propped on the surface, head hanging low, glasses threatening to slide down. The thinking pose. Dad? He looked up, and it took him a whole of three seconds to realize Sabrina had heard most of it. Only in part due to the red pressure dents the railing had left on her face. What do you think? she asked him. Like, deep down. He pulled a chair out for Sabrina and joined her sitting at the table. For a little while they shared another bout of poignant silence, an impromptu moment honoring the loss. I think it's tragic, he said then. But I didn't know her. I'm not going to sit here guessing. Will it change anything right now? No, Lyra's team will see it through. She handpicked those 44 people over the years. She trusted them with everything concerning the project. Father sighed. It would be reckless to be the only one with access. What if she truly did get a heart attack? or slipped on a staircase and fell to her death. Why didn't she tell them how she felt? Sabrina asked. Do you think her mother might be right? That it was foul play of some kind? To what end? Sabrina shrugged. True. If her death changed nothing, what would be anyone's reason to kill her? Jealousy? Personal vendetta? None of it made sense. Dad, do you think she was afraid something might go wrong? Of course she was afraid. I bet she was terrified, he said. It's like the surgery that she must have to live, yet she know that it will never be a guaranteed success. But if Lyra had a reasonable doubt, found a mistake that might have necessitated stopping the project altogether, I understand she might not be able to handle it. It would be a complete disaster, yes but she would have told her team first, before she took her life. Of that I am certain. But can we be certain? I mean, it just creates so many questions, doesn't it? Father sucked in his upper lip, then pulled it back through clenched teeth. Yes, it does. 
and if the video got out to the public, it would be chaos. But her team will be asking these same questions. They will come through the entire thing over and over again to make sure our assumptions are correct. Sabrina got up. She couldn't stand to sit in one place right now. I'll make something to drink, she said. She loved talking to him. Even if he himself was worried and unsure, he somehow always found a way to help her get grounded, stop her mind from spinning. How was she supposed to leave him? They must be correct, he whispered as the water began to boil. What do you mean? We've tried everything else. If Project Hope fails, I don't think we'll have time to find the next one. Don't say that. We are extraordinarily resilient in believing that things will be all right, he said. That if there is a will, there is a way. And it's great, don't get me wrong. It is what helped us survive through the ages when we should have given up. I remember, before Elira, we had all these ideas, projects, shady estimates we were scared to re-examine. All of it scrambling to find something for us, letting us stay blind to the world falling apart right behind our walls. But it was all scraps, little bits of fabricated optimism, too late to make a difference. If Project Hope fails, and we go back to having just that, I think it's over. Sabrina set a cup of tea in front of her father and met his eyes. He smiled when he looked at her and she smiled back. At least that. I wish I could do my part, she said quietly. But I don't want to leave you here alone. But that I was thinking. If I managed to make Eric marry me, we could both stay, right? And I think I could manage. Father shook his head. If you married Eric, you'd have to go in. I'd no longer be your most immediate family. He would. It was as if someone kneecapped her. Sabrina realized that she had still thought she could have had it all. Really? Really. But you should go in. That's where the real life will be taking place. A wondrous irony. No, I can't do that. Don't be stupid. She stammered. It was the right choice. This was the right choice. It had to be. You're staying here, watching over us. I'm not going to leave you alone with all the robots and all. No. Sabrina, honey? Yes, you will. I won't choose Eric over you. I would never. <laughs> I would hope so, her father laughed. But you will choose your happiness over me. And if he's that, well, lucky boy. Dad. He shrugged and gave her another smile. Can't you just be an asshole about it? She asked, pushing back the tears. No, nope, sorry. If it's got a suck for me, it's got a suck a bit for you too. But you're dad. You're supposed to protect me from feeling bad. And you're a grown-ass woman. No more cuddling. Sabrina caught him in an embrace and pressed her face into his warm shoulder. I love you. And if you change your mind, you tell me. I won't change my mind. Because I love you too.